Okay, so welcome you all, all of you, to the uh, next session and the final session of this research symposium, the first of its kind. Uh, I hope all of you had a good time listening to all your fellow uh, research scholars giving interesting topics, to talks on their uh, various research topics. So in this session, the first talk is by Srijit, who will be talking on glass stethoscopes for power transformers. Good afternoon. In today's world, a lot of emphasis has been directed towards condition monitoring of capital intensive structures like dams, bridges, and oil pipelines, and so on, in order to protect the associated investment. Today, I'd like to draw your attention towards one such equipment, the power transformer. Just like a doctor uses a stethoscope to listen to the signals from your body, just imagine if we had one to listen to the signals from a transformer. In a couple of minutes, you will realize that this thing is very much possible. And what's more interesting is that these stethoscopes are made of glass. Let's move into the structure of a power transformer. Now here I have a three-phase transformer in which has three sets of primary low voltage windings and secondary high voltage windings wound around a core. Each of these windings consists of multiple layers of conductors which are paper insulated and the windings per se are insulated with a press board layer in between. In an oil fill transformer, the entire structure is immersed in insulating oil which also serves the dual purpose of acting as a coolant. Now, an interesting study conducted a decade ago on the analysis of failures of power transformers has revealed that the most frequent and the costliest among the reasons for the failure of a transformer is due to the damage of the insulation. Just like every one of us, the transformer is also experiencing a lot of stress during its working. And the insulation weakens as a result of the continuous accumulated stress, electrical, thermal and mechanical stresses accumulated over the long years of operation. And it has been shown that these weak spots in insulation are prone to what are known as partial discharges and these discharges act as precursors to, in, to the transformer failure. So in some sense, monitoring the level of partial discharge can be an effective tool towards ensuring the health of the insulation. Now let's try to understand what exactly is a partial discharge, what is so partial about it. Now just like any other discharge, a partial discharge is also characterized by a flow of electrons, but then it is highly localized. It occurs somewhere within the insulation and does not bridge the gap between the two conductors. Let us consider the system where I have two conductors separated by an insulator, and let's assume that due to the deterioration of the insulation, somewhere within the ins insulation a void has been formed. Physically, this void could be a gas bubble inside the transformer oil, or it could be a crack or fissure in the paper or press board insulation. Now, the void is characterized by a dielectric constant which is much lesser than the surrounding insulating medium. Under the conditions of high electric field, which is sufficient enough to overcome the breakdown field of the void, the void simply collapses, thereby generating a discharge. The discharge is also associated with a release of small amount of heat energy, it also triggers some chemical reactions, it emits an electromagnetic pulse, and also it generates a small pressure wave within the insulating region. Now, all these forms opportunities for us to detect the presence of this partial discharge standing outside of the transformer. What is particularly more interesting is that 
the acoustic method of detection of partial discharge is quite advantageous because the acoustic signals are nicely propagated in the oil medium and they hit the transformer tank walls. This can be thought of as a similar case when you have a ripples generated in a water body when you throw a stone in it. You disturb the system and you get some pressure waves. Exactly what that's what happens in a partial discharge as well. Now conventionally, these acoustic signals are detected using piezoelectric based transducers mounted on the external surface of the tank wall. However, recently fiber optic sensors are also found to be good alternatives to such acoustic signal measurements. Primarily due to the fact that since fiber optic sensors are made of dielectric material, that is glass, it is completely immune to electromagnetic interference. Now it is highly justified because as you might all know, the transformer is a highly electromagnetically polluted environment. So this can help us to have better sensitivity of our measurements. In addition to being small size and lightweight, the fiber optic sensors are also amenable to array sensing which can help in localizing the discharge, partial discharge. So in short, my fo my, the focus of our research is to detect acoustic emissions from partial discharges using fiber optic based sensors. Now the specific fiber optic sensor that we'll be focusing on is the fiber Bragg grating sensors. The inspiration for fiber Bragg grating sensors come from nature where you see these beautiful colors of the peacock feather are actually different colors that the different colors are reflected due to the microstructured gratings in these structures. Now, in a similar way, if we can have a periodic structure inside the core of an optical fiber, then you achieve what is known as a fiber Bragg grating. The grating is characterized by a specific wave, a specific color that is being reflected of the grating when you excite it with a broad band of colors, while all other colors are transmitted through. The grating obeys the Bragg's diffraction theory, and it has been shown that the peak wavelength of reflection, which is known as the Bragg wavelength, is a function of the effective refractive index and the period of the grating. All that is fine, but now how do we use this element as a sensor? Well, if the grating is subjected to a strain, let's say it changes the grating period and the effective refractive index, thereby changing the Bragg wavelength, hence now you can see that the grating is reflecting a different color. So in some sense, I can say that the strain variations are now encoded in the wavelength of the light that is being reflected back. This is quite attractive because any information that is encoded in wavelength is generally impervious to noise and it can be transmitted over long distances without affected by getting affected by getting correct, corrupted by noise. Now, a normal photodiode or a photodetector is blind to wavelength, sense, wavelength changes. It can only sense intensity variations. So now how do we make our photodiode to see these wavelength variations? Now that is possible with the help of a tunable laser source instead of having a broadband source as the input. First, let me focus on this red curve here. Although I had mentioned that the fiber Bragg grating reflects only a single color, a practical grating would reflect a band of wavelengths centered around a peak wavelength. So what you see in red here is the reflection spectrum of a grating. Now we use a tunable laser source to tune over this reflected, uh, over the reflection spectrum of the grating and we fix it at the slope of this reflection spectrum. Now remember that the tunable laser is fixed at that point. When the grating is now subjected to strain, uh, for example, in an acoustic emission case, it would be subjected to dynamic strain. So now the reflection spectrum will keep dancing around this tunable laser source, thereby changing the amount of power that is being reflected into the photodetector. So if you see, as the reflection spectrum moves around the tunable laser, my photodiode is now seeing an intensity variation corresponding to the wavelength variation. So this is how we enable 
the conversion of wavelength encoded information into a corresponding intensity in encoded information. Now, this technique we went ahead and tested on a laboratory level to detect partial discharges. So, I have the experimental setup here where I used an oil filled miniaturized test cell which has the facility to generate a discharge when it is excited by an appropriate high voltage source and I paste my fiber bracket grating sensor on the inner surface of the test cell wall. As discussed before, the grating is interrogated with the help of a tunable laser and in addition, we use a ultra high frequency sensor to capture the electromagnetic pulse that is being emitted by our, by the discharge, which is, which is being used as a reference measurement. A typical time domain trace that we would capture in this experiment would look something like this, where the signal in red is the signal that is being captured by the UHF sensor and the signal in blue is the acoustic emission captured, acoustic wave captured by the FBG sensor. Now, clearly you see a delay between these two signals even though they originated from the same PD event. Now, that is explained because the electromagnetic signal travels at the speed of light while the acoustic, is, acoustic wave is much slower. So, it is the similar phenomena that you might have observed when you see the lightning before you hear the sound of the thunder. After showing that these gratings can detect partial discharges, we went ahead and explored the possibility of classifying as well as localizing partial discharges. For the purpose of classification, we tested out three different types of partial discharges configurations and we, ca we had a time domain trace of each of them and analyzed those time domain traces in the frequencies in the in the spectral domain. Then further, we divided the spectral domain into three different ranges and calculated the relative share of spectral energy in each of those ranges. And what you see in this plot here are the different trials, almost 100 of them performed for each type of partial discharge. Now, what is interesting is that these, kind, these trials cluster around different regions in this plot indicating a possibility of classification. For example, the signals that are being generated from a corona type of partial discharge have a higher frequency content in this particular frequency range as opposed to the lower frequencies. So, this can help us in providing an idea about the type of partial discharge that is being uh, generated inside the transformer. Another aspect to this is localizing partial discharges that is it is also important to identify where exactly the discharge has originated which will help us to take a appropriate corrective action. The way to go about that is that you employ multiple sensors within the transformer tank to pick up the signals from the same discharge event. For example, for illustration I have shown you two different sensors attached to two different locations in the transformer tank. and depending on the distance of the source from the sensors, each of the, the, the wave packet would arrive at the sensors at different times. Now, if you could somehow estimate the time difference of arrival of the signals, then it is possible to incorporate the velocity information and find out what would be the distance of the sensors from the source. Although uh, uh, the use of two sensors can perform only a linear uh, localization, you could employ a minimum of four sensors to do a direct 3D localization. So, to conclude, we have demonstrated detection, classification and localization of partial discharges in power transformers using these fiber bracket grating based sensors. We have obtained charge sensitivity of the order of hundreds of pico coulombs, a classification accuracy of more than 95 percent and a location accuracy of the order of a centimeter. So, in short, we have proved that fiber bracket gratings are tangible solutions for conditioning monitoring of power transformers. I would like to acknowledge my research advisor, Dr. Balaji Srinivasan and also Professor Sarathi from High Voltage Lab for providing the test facilities in IITM. 
And also, I'd like to acknowledge the Photonics Group and High Voltage Lab members. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, for now we have investigated only three different types of discharges, but there could be multiple types. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the two types here had an overlap. Uh, so when we consider a different frequency range, they actually overlapped each other. So we tried to, distinct, in order for the purpose of demonstration, we tried to select a suitable frequency range so that there's no, I mean, this is quite ambi uh, not ambiguous. Yeah, so this plot here, uh, so I have considered a frequency range of 0 to 350 kilohertz. Now I divide the frequency range into three parts and I calculate what is the spectral energy of the signal in each of these frequency ranges. Then I normalize it with the total energy and that's what I plot here. For example, here, this blue trace here, it contains 60 percentage of energy in this frequency range. 20% in 100 to 200 kilohertz range, and another 20% in the 0 to 200 kilohertz, 0 to 100 kilohertz range. Yes, yes, this is what uh, is being uh, conventionally used for classification. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is uh, with respect to the localization part of it. Yeah, but then uh, we are employing multiple sensors to capture the same PD event. So yeah, uh, there could be errors in localization, I agree to that. Yeah, that would lead to attenuation of signals and we would get probably lesser SNR at the output. Time for one more question also. Yeah, that's true. So we have not tried uh, different sizes of particles. We have tried just one type of particle. And what happens is that the particle levitates in the electric field. And every time it makes a contact with the ground electrode, it releases this kind of, I mean, it generates this particular discharge. So the way it uh, levitates for each cycle of the high voltage could be different, and that's why we expect that the frequencies are quite scattered. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, Srijit. Uh, so next.